I think we should do the cathedral. Uh, the mysterious summons we got before. You're cordially invited to a rendezvous at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Uh, let's do that then. Tomorrow night, so it has to be today. Let's go. Accept. You haven't been to a church since you became a vampire. Or kindred, as the euphemism goes. You had to focus on concrete, practical things like surviving and feeding. You've learned the essentials of the vampire experience but you don't really have a clear idea of what it all means. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine is a New York landmark. You've been inside once before, when you were much younger. You marveled at its gothic facade. Looking at it now from across the street, it feels ominous. The prospect of an anonymous invitation to a secret meeting is a worrying one, but the venue is well chosen. It's hard to imagine a violent attack in a place like this, with eyes everywhere. You enter the cathedral discreetly. You've quickly learned that this is an essential skill for a vampire. How to move without anyone noticing you. The full force of the cathedral's architecture hits you as you walk between the pews. If the architect meant to create the feeling of being small in the face of God's glory, mission accomplished. Based on the note, you're assuming that whoever you're meeting is somewhere in the front. As you step closer to the high altar, it feels as if something is dragging at your feet, as if the stone behind, beneath you resisted your movement. Uh, Vampires are satanic creatures. It occurs to you that many people might consider you a satanic creature, a, vamp a vampire as you are. In movies, vampires can't enter a church. They're burned by a cross. Yet, here you are. That means it's okay, right? There's an old man sitting in the front. You see only the back of his head, bowed down in silent prayer. Your footsteps echo on the floor, and he turns to look at you. You can't take your eyes off him. He's tall, dignified, white hair balding, a few strands escaping to the sides. He's wearing glasses and simple clerical clothing. His eyes are warm and pale, too kind for someone like you. Something is wrong. You feel heavy, as if a giant hand was pressing you down. The skin on your face is burning. Perhaps unconsciously, you expected something like this, as a vampire walking into a cathedral. Only it's not the building or God making you feel like you're burning alive. It's the man, the priest. Welcome, my child. The priest's tone is kind, but the rising panic inside is telling you that kindness is not for the likes of you. Uh, fortitude, you can tough it out. Let's try that. Whatever it is, you can tough it out with your vampiric abilities. As you step closer to the priest, panic rises inside you. The emotions are hard to control. Fear, anger, pain, all trying to wrestle you in different directions, away. The resilience of your vampiric body is the only thing affording you a moment's respite. Yet, you know it cannot, that it can't take much of this. Can I help you? Are you okay? The priest talks to you like he would a lost vagrant who has chosen to enter the house of God. Um... I'm s Please, it hurts. Please, it hurts. Sit down and tell me what's wrong. Taking a closer look at you, the priest realizes how much you're struggling to simply stand there. Are you... one of them? It's simply too much. You mutter something incoherent in reply. You don't sound like a vampire, an undead being made powerful by immortal blood. You're just another sad, confused, lost soul. You turn around and stagger away, only feeling like yourself once you're back on the street outside. You stand on the sidewalk, confused and scared. No enemy seemed to be attacking you. The priest didn't follow you. The night air is wet with the smells of the city, the same as every night. How did it feel? You look at the man speaking to you. He's well-dressed, if a little archaic. Dark-haired, handsome like a character from an old movie. 
He smiles as if he knows there's something you don't. You glance around. There are people on the street. You don't appear to be in immediate danger. Why does this hurt so much? That's the question I wanted to talk to you about. Let me introduce myself. My name is Benoit Segal. We share many things in common, even if you don't know me. I like Benoit, he looks, he looks pretty hip. Benoit offers his hand to you. You shake hands. Benoit's handshake is firm and dry. He looks at you intently, as if trying to find something in your eyes. Would you mind sitting with me for a moment? Benoit points to a park bench nearby, in darkness because of a broken streetlight. Wary, you decide to follow him. Only an enemy totally unconcerned with the masquerade would attack you here. Benoit sits down and you follow suit. For a moment you both contemplate the cathedral in silence. I know how it feels, what you just felt. I have experienced it myself many times. For a moment you consider how to respond. It's clear Benoit sent the invitation to come here and orchestrated this little setup. Uh, did you try to get me killed? Did you just try to get me killed? No, it's possible you could die, but it requires an immense force of will to remain in their presence. I knew you didn't have it in you. I wanted you to meet Father Anthony, or see him, experience him. Did you wonder why it felt like that? It was the priest. At first I thought it was because I was in a church, but then I realized it came from him, the priest. I think you're right. It does come from him. It's his faith that makes you feel like that. He's safe in his belief while you are one of the damned. Do you ever wonder what's the role of a vampire in God's creation? Not really. You stop to think. Of course you've wondered what this is all about. Whether it's about God or nature, you really don't really know what being a vampire means. That's the trouble with the masquerade. A human faced with a human problem can go online and find something that helps. You can't. The masquerade means that everything there is to know about your condition is secret, hidden away. You're left relying on the unreliable opinions of people like Benoit. Suddenly, Benoit takes your hand and presses it against his chest. As he stares into your eyes, you feel his heart stop. My heart no longer beats, yet I move, I talk. Is that how God intended us to be? Uh, let me go. Let go of my hand, you asshole. Wow. Benoit lets go of your hand and you quickly withdraw it. You're asking yourself these same questions. You know you are. Sometimes I'm skeptical too, but in Father Anthony's presence, I know faith is real. I know because it, I know it because it hurts so much. But perhaps you have questions about faith and our kind. Um. Perhaps here we go. Perhaps we are divine, not damned. Benoit laughs, and for the first time, the aura of bitterness enveloping him lifts. You're clever. There are many religious cults among the kindred, even more among the Anarchs. Some of them do indeed believe we are divine. We die, we rise again, just like Jesus. Be careful with that kind of talk, though. You might not know it, but there are always politics attached to every belief. Go into an Elysium, declare your divinity, and everyone around will start making assumptions about you. Sometimes faith is best kept private, even among our kind. Just ask yourself, when you met Father Anthony, did you feel divine? Uh, did I just come here to talk about religion? Did you have anything else, or did I come here just to talk about religion? I know it's overwhelming. It was for me when I first met Father Anthony. I know there are others like him, whose faith shines like a beacon. Priests, old ladies, children. Anyone can have that conviction inside them. Uh, I have to pray for guidance. Before we talk anymore, I have to pray for guidance. I don't know what to think and I need help. 
I don't know why I've suddenly made my character religious, but hey ho. Benoit nods patiently. Let's meet again in a few nights, here at the cathedral. We could talk more after you've thought it through. You leave Benoit sitting in the shadow of the cathedral, contemplating what lies within. It would be easier to ignore his words without the reality of what you experienced. Father Anthony was holy. You know it to be true, but, but what does that mean? Alright, we did that. Let's go see... So we've got time to see one more, so I think we should go see... This guy. Uh, Agathon, the blood sorcerer. Do I want to learn... Do I, yeah, let's meet the Tremere guy. So we're gonna go see him. Agathon. You arrive at the address given to you by Sophie. A small bookstore smack dab in the middle of Broadway, of all places. What really catches you off guard, though, is the store's display. From what you've heard about the Tremere, they are infamous for their ties to the occult and the mystical. And yet now, looking at the oddball collection of items in the display window, it all feels borderline satirical. The books here cover everything from Ayurvedic practices and homeopathy to wellness and self-motivation. The vaguely amusing juxtapositions don't end there either. You notice a copy of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible tucked behind a cheap smiling Buddha. A scientific journal on hematology sits next to a teen-oriented pamphlet on the blood type personality theory. There's a blood type personality theory? Huh, I'm gonna look that up later. A number of religious and quasi-religious symbols, lockets, pins, and various emblazoned paraphernalia are haphazardly strewn across the display and between the tomes. Before you even open the door, you can smell the burning incense and hear the corny Far East, far east tinged music seeping through the crackling speaker mounted above the entrance. It's much more quaint than what you expected from what Sophie told you about the so-called warlocks. It doesn't look like they have much interest in impressing outsiders. Then again, if there's anything you've learned these past few nights, it's that appearances can be deceiving. At this time of night, the shop appears to be closed. Regardless, you ring the bell. You hear someone shuffling around inside. A brief moment later, the latch slides, and the door is pushed open just a few inches. A tired-looking blonde in loose clothes appears in the crack. She seems confused, like you just woke her up. She lets out a yawn, scratching at her tattooed neck. Finally, she squints in your general direction. Her pierced lip curves into an awkward smile. Uh, is Agathon in? I'm looking for a guy named Agathon. Is he around? The girl gives you a suspicious look over, but opens the door. She takes a few steps back and you hear footsteps coming from behind a floral curtain that covers the back door. A bespectacled, smart-looking woman emerges and looks straight at you. Come in and follow me. Just don't touch anything, please. Oh, I've seen this lady in cosplay. I don't know her name yet. You follow her through the store. Inside, as expected, the stuffy air smells of sandalwood, frankincense, and a dozen other aromas. The woman leads you behind the curtain and through the back door, onto a rickety staircase. A flight of steps takes you up to the second story. You instantly notice the change in decor, as the tacky New Age bookstore gives way to something resembling a cross between a library and a workshop. The smell here is strong, too, but much more layered. You're not sure what to make of it at first, but with each whiff it becomes apparent. Blood. The aroma, though subtle at first, soon becomes overpowering. It takes you a moment to adapt and focus. Oh, it's Eiling! Eiling Sturbridge. I don't think you know who you're speaking with, so an introduction is in order. My name is Eiling Sturbridge, and I am the High Regent of the Chantry of the Five Boroughs. You are Celine, correct? I have to say you're lucky the ward outside the building is only there for notifications tonight. Otherwise it would have been quite unpleasant. 
To answer your question, Agathon is here, but he is hard at work, and I wouldn't want to disturb him. Am I to understand this is a social visit? Um, how do you know who I am? Wait, how do you know who I am? Well, for one thing, knowing who's who in this city is one of my duties as High Regent. But more importantly, you've been on the mind of many a kindred since Langley took you in. It's quite a precedent, as I'm sure you know. A first under Prince Panhard. And for Sophie to be the one to do it? Curiouser and curiouser. Still, I'm sure you haven't come here to look for dirt on your sire. That would be unwise. Uh... Sophie suggested I should meet Agathon. She said he's quite knowledgeable. Did she now? Eiling looks you up and down. Her countenance seems unchanged. But you can tell she's judging what you said. That's new. Suddenly, a man enters from a side room. He doesn't even look at you, lost in his own thoughts. I have it, Eiling. I think I know how to find it. He catches himself as he notices you. His face turns sour. A visitor? Yes, we were just discussing you, in fact. Is that so? Uh, let me introduce myself. Let me introduce myself. My name is Salim. I've been told you might be interested in teaming up. Teaming up? He seems very confused by the notion. What for? Uh, I could assist you in your work. I could assist you in your work. I can be quite helpful, knowing I can count on someone to return the favor. Is that right? He seems to consider it, then turns to Eiling. Hi, Regent. May I ask your advice on this? She looks you over, as if judging your worth. It takes her just long enough to make you feel uncomfortable. When she takes her eyes off you, she addresses Agathon. Do you feel like you need assistance in your task, my child? I am confident I can do it on my own. He pauses, hesitating for a second. But I do believe it is important enough to warrant outside help, even if for only a single night. Another brief moment of hesitation. Of course, the details would remain between you and I, sire. Agreed, on all points. Why don't you start by giving our intern here a brief explanation of what it is you're after? Agathon gives Eiling a hesitant look, but the woman nods approvingly. Encouraged, he turns towards you. A member of our clan disappeared without a trace a handful of nights ago. While the High Regent investigates if any foul play was involved, I have been tasked with recovering her research notes. If there's anything left to recover, that is. I may have an idea where to start looking, and I suppose this is where you come in. If you truly wish to help, I could use your assistance tonight. Right now, in fact. Given the time we've just wasted on idle chatter, I should leave immediately. Uh, what's the... who's the missing person? And the missing kindred? Who is she? A single glance at Eiling is enough. You can tell you're not getting an answer. At least for now. We're after her research, that's what you should focus on. These people aren't in the habit of making things simple. Facing layers upon layers of secrecy, you can only hope that what lies beneath is the real deal. I'm heading out. Are you coming or not? Sure, I'll join you. Very well. He gives Eileen a slight bow. Hi, Regent, with your permission. She nods. Before you go, however... Selene, defer to Agathon in all things. Our clan values obedience above everything else. Prove you can follow and this, not this might turn into a mutually beneficial relationship. I will await his return and his report. Good luck, my child. Agathon bows again and heads out, urging you to follow. The High Regent watches you leave. Outside, Agathon leads you to his car. It's almost funny seeing him get behind a wheel. Somehow you ex you'd expect a more mystical means of transportation. Like what? He rides a unicorn? A devil unicorn? 
Blood's Pegasus, maybe? You drive south, heading to the lower east side. Agathon seems lost in thought. Either that or he's a very careful driver. Either way, several minutes pass in silence. Remain quiet. You decide not to disturb his thoughts, and are surprised that it's him who breaks the silence as you're about halfway over the East River. Let me ask you something. Why me? There's likely a couple hundred of us kindred in New York, yet you seek me out specifically. Why? Spo Sophie spoke highly of you. For one, Spo Sophie spoke highly of you. She gave me a short list of people to meet. You were on it. I see. Once more he grows silent. You're unsure whether to continue prying as your driver seems to disappear into his thoughts. You drive into Williamsburg and stop by a fancy looking building. We're here. There's a restaurant on the top floor. You wanted to help, so here's your chance. I need you to get ins inside the VIP lobby. You recognize the place. It's where you were embraced a, few, a mere few nights back. Funny how this restaurant is apparently a vampire magnet. Once we're in, I need about half an hour of focus and some space. It'll be up to you to keep attention away from the room. Can you do it? He doesn't wait for an answer and points to the front door. Go ahead, I'm right behind you. The two of you take the elevator up to the restaurant. The door opens and you see that there are only a few guests left, sitting at their tables. An important looking staff member approaches you. Good evening. I'm very sorry, but the restaurant is closing for the night. I can make a reservation for next week if you wish. Uh, let's try dominate. Oh, but we insist. You will let us enter the VIP lobby and stay there for as long as we like. But, of course. Please come in. You walk in, trying to look casual and make your way towards the VIP lobby. You step inside and close the door behind you. This is a familiar sight. The same place where you had your last meal as a mortal. Strange. You should feel... something. But the lavishly decorated room looks almost plain to you. Your companion looks at you with something akin to admiration. Or at least, that's how you choose to interpret the slight change in his usual somber facade. Not bad, not bad at all. He inspects the room. It's unusually cold, and Agathon soon discovers why. Looking behind the curtain, a window hangs open. The handle and lock look like they've been dissolved, as if with acid. God damn it, Juno. What's with the window? Looks like she's gone. Whoever Juno is, it looks like she's no longer here. A flash of fury sparks in his eyes. Yeah, no kidding. He takes a frantic look around the room. This changes things. Keep an eye on the door. I'll need some time. Half an hour at the very least. Nobody disturbs me, understand? He hastily pushes a couch and some potted plants out of the way, moves a bar stool and takes out a curved knife. Cutting into his own arm, he lets some of his blood drip onto the wooden floor. It's pretty fucked up, the way his flesh oozes the deep red thick vitae. In life, you'd have found his stomach churning, but right now you feel weirdly turned on by the sight. What follows is more disturbing yet. Bloody Tremere, they're all so weird, aren't they? With one hand, he sheaves the knife and seals the wound. With the other, he smears the blood around him while muttering some weird chant. It sounds vaguely Latin, but you're pretty sure it isn't. It's all more than a little disconcerting, but he seems to know what he's doing. A few moments later, the circle starts glowing faintly, as thin wisps of smoke surround Agathon. He sits down in the middle, cross-legged, eyes closed. Minutes pass. Agathon's face twitches from time to time, and his head turns every now and then, as if he was looking around or listening in on a conversation. The smoke grows thicker, forming a veil around the mage. You expected something more flashy, but it's still a sight to behold. You wonder what the point of it is, but refrain from asking. It's probably best to let Agathon do his thing. 
For close to 30 minutes, you're left to your own devices. Suddenly, the door swings open, and the manager storms in, ready to raise hell. The initial haze must have worn off quicker than usual. Calm him down. You try to calm the man down, but he'll have none of it. He keeps shouting and threatens to call security. That's when Agathon finally gets up off the floor. He shakes his head and casually walks over to the sofa, picking up something from between the cracks in the upholstery. We're done here, let's go. Who the hell do you think you are? Get out of my restaurant this instant. Not wanting to make the situation any worse, you walk out sheepishly. The manager follows you all the way to the elevator, shouting and cursing. Agathon doesn't seem particularly phased by any of this. The restaurant staff throw you some curious glances as you walk towards the elevator, but wisely decide not to bother you. The ride down feels tense. You half expect to see a police car waiting outside. Agathon only seems to relax once you're back in, the, in his car. He starts the engine and takes a right at the Continental Army Plaza, back onto the bridge towards Manhattan. You're just about to say something, but Agathon beats you to it. That went better than I expected, all things considered. It might have been a trick of the light, but you're pretty sure you just saw a smile. Oh, the freaking wind, the wind, the rearview mirror thingy is so creepy. Oh. I'm used to working alone, but what I'm dealing with right now, it might require some more assistance, and you seem capable enough. Uh, found what you came for? So I'm guessing you found what you came for. Sort of. Enough to continue the search, at any rate. That seems to deplete your social battery for the night. You drive the rest of the way in silence. It doesn't take you long to reach the Warlock's hideout. Agathon waves at you absentmindedly. Once again, lost in his thoughts. Hopelessly so. One of these nights, you should probably take him up on his offer. Who knows, if you gain his trust, maybe you can actually break through his historic facade and meet the man underneath. Alright, we did it. We've got... Well, we've got to rest, because the sun's about to come up, but we're doing things. So let's go do rest. See what's gonna happen tomorrow night. Not long after you wake up tonight, Gregory will knocks on the door of your apartment. Hey, I came to pick you up. Miss Langley wants to see you. Uh, do you know what she's... Well, my freedom was good while it lasted. Those last two nights were nice. I had freedom, initiative. Good while it lasted, I guess. He smiles apologetically. Don't shoot the messenger. The car's waiting, shall we? You wrestle with the same thoughts as a few nights ago. Maybe you should just leave? Disappear? Let Sophie find somebody else to employ? But then you remember the Anarch thug being cut down by Kadir and how close you were to be to the same fate not even a week ago. And that it still might happen if you step out of line. You follow suit. As with your previous visit here, Sophie seems not entirely present when you enter. Her eyes are locked onto one of the paintings in the, in the room. You're pretty sure it was here earlier, but she's behaving as if she's seeing it for the first time in her life, entirely entranced. Gregory clears his throat, Sophie turns to the both of you, a bit of irritation in her countenance that soon gives way to a pleasant, warm smile. You're here, excellent. Thank you, Gregory. The driver leaves and she turns her attention to you. I hope you had a good few nights and made some new acquaintances. But I have to say, I'm happy to see you, Celine. Thank you for coming. The change in mood of the room is so sudden and startling, it makes you consider the true power of the vampiric charisma. Rationally, you know you're being manipulated, but you don't even care. Her eyes, her motions, her entire body language, all feel 100% genuine in, in expressing legitimate interest in you and your well-being. I have a request for you this night. 
I need you to find somebody for me and make a delivery. She points to the statue at the side of the room. You notice a plain looking flash drive lying on the edge where the inanimate archer's bow touches the pedestal. So I'm guessing it's that one there. The man you'll be looking for calls himself Kaiser. He has eyes and ears all over New York, and it's rare for something to happen here without his knowledge. I'll need you to take this flash drive and bring it to him. In exchange, he will give you an address, which I need to know as soon as possible. You're about to ask what's on the drive, but Sophie proves to be one step ahead of you. Oh, don't worry about the contents. They are encrypted. A precaution for if the data falls into the wrong hands. But it won't, correct? She gives you a smile that just a handful of nights ago would make you feel like melting. Oh, and Selene? Kaiser is a Nosferatu, a twisted, deformed lineage of kindred. He is old and his age has made him even more paranoid than others of his clan tend to be. He holds many havens and changes them often. From what I've gathered, he or one of his servants should be found at the park on Coney Island tonight. You'll have to identify them, somehow. Oh, I'm scared, I'm gonna mess this up. I'm told Kaiser has spent many of his nights these past few years being driven around the city in a black limo. Maybe keep an eye out for it. That smile again, but much shorter. Uh, anything more on Kaiser? Anything more you can tell me about Kaiser? He's been here a long time, about as long as I have. He got into a lot of trouble for exchanging information with both the Anarchs and the Camarilla in, pa in the past, but ultimately got off scot-free. Kaiser's web of information proved to be strong enough to shield him from the consequences of playing both sides. Some say that's the best proof of his abilities. In any case, be careful when talking to him. He's very particular about everyone's etiquette, except his own. Good night and good luck. She flashes one last smile at you and turns back to the painting, clearly done with the conversation. You pocket the flash drive and head out toward Coney Island. It takes you the better part of an hour to reach the lights and sounds of the Coney Island and music amusement park from the city. The drive is almost pleasant for this time of night. Thank God for Belt Parkway. There are plenty of people here tonight, but nobody who stands out as a travelling purveyor of secrets. Then again, if they did stand out, it would be kind of pointless, right? Nothing to do but figure out the right approach. Uh, I guess we're gonna search. I don't think we should ask around. We'll search for signs. There are plenty of nooks and crannies to investigate around here, but if Kaiser frequents this area, there has to be some kind of clue to grab onto, right? You spend a good hour snooping around, eyes peeled for the black limo Sophie mentioned, or any sign that a Nosferatu, or any vampire, has their haven around these parts. Zilch. Annoyed, you turn back toward the lights of the amusement park, only to find a man standing in your way, wearing an oversized jacket, he had the air of a junkie or dealer about him. Who knows what he's got in those pockets. You lost? Uh, maybe. What's it to you? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. What's it to you? What kind of answer is that? You a spook? A fed? He looks at you intently, like he's trying to guess your real purpose here. Get out of here before I kick your ass. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking for a guy. Chill, I'm just looking for a guy. Drives around in a black limo, stops here sometimes, ring any bells. No idea what you're yapping about. He's a terrible liar, clearly full of shit. Uh, Dominique. Give me a phone and go for a swim in the bay. It's a hunch. You give the simple order and the man can do little to resist. He produces his phone. It's a fancy model and doesn't look like anything ready available on the market. Hands it to you. Turns away and starts walking. The phone's locked, but a recent smudge on the screen gives you a rough idea of what the combination might be. You get it right on the second try. 
There's just one number in the phone book, unlabeled. You dial it and hear someone pick it up. The voice is like a rusty pitchfork scraping against gravel. Oh gosh, do I need to do this voice? Jackie, you're messing up my snuff session here. I know it better be something big. Um, I have something for you on from Sophie. Hi, I have something for you from Sophie Langley. Care to come pick it up? Silence. Not even a sound. The call ends. You try calling again, but the number is blocked. Nothing to do but wait to see if she, he shows up. Not 15 minutes pass before a black limo stops near where you're waiting. One door opens an invitation. The inside of the limo used to be a luxury lounge, the kind with a stripper pole and a bar full of alcohol. But it currently has none of that. Instead, there are monitors and consoles. There were dozens of displays, each one showing something different. Surveillance camera footage, stock market quotes, television news, emails, tweets, silent movies, lo-fi footage of a gory torture session. Oh, what? Oh, lo-fi, not lo-fi music, just lo-fi. <gasps> you wonder if the limo's owner can focus on anything while surrounded by all of this visual noise, and then realize there's nobody there, or is there? A man blinks into existence on a leather-covered couch, attempting to maintain something that approximates a regal presence. You're 100% sure it's Kaiser. Surrounded by dimly lit computer screens, his features are even more ghastly than you imagined. All sharp angles of twisted bone, mangled flesh, and crooked teeth. He bears them all in an awful parody of a smile. Suddenly, somebody grabs you from behind, twists your arm, and pushes your head against the car's roof. I got them, boss! I have them! The Nosferatu chuckles. Oh, congratulations, dickweed! Could've done that before you gave away the fucking phone. Oh, I like him. He looks cool. Just let them go already. I like- he looks cool. He makes me think of the... I kinda get... Lord of the Rings Orcs vibe from this guy. I like it. I like his suit, it's pretty dashing. TLDR, I don't know why he, people think he's scary. I hope you guys like his voice too. But... You gotta make me repeat myself, you thick motherfucker! He lets go. You take a look at him. The man is confused and soaking wet. He flashes you an angry stare, but obeys his boss order, boss's orders to the letter. What are you waiting for? A formal invitation? Get in the car, we have some talking to do. I feel like I've already lost his voice, after doing it once. The doors close behind you. So Langley, huh? I'm guessing you've got something for me then. You reluctantly pull the flash drive from your pocket and slowly pass it to Kaiser. He plugs it into a USB port on the arm of his chair and displays the data on one of their screens that happen to be turned away from you. It takes him about a minute to access the data. Who do you people think I am? I saw this footage a week ago. He removes the flashlight drive and throws it back at you in disgust. Tell Sophie the deal's off. She wants her address, she can give me something else. Uh, let's try presents. Oh, he's too old, so I don't think we could do it. Let's try that. I can't use that. I'm not hungry. I don't have enough hunger, I think. Let's try presents. No, let's try just this one. Who does this guy think he is? You're not a pushover. You're not intimidated by this asshole's MO. You will get what you came here for. You better reconsider. I brought you what you wanted. You have something you owe us. Don't be stupid. He gives you a patronizing look. Firstly, I don't owe anybody anything. Second, you should watch your tongue, because I'm this close to ripping it out and using it to wipe my ass. Oh, nice. You want your address? You're going to have to work for it. And now that you've pissed me off, you're gonna have to work extra hard. I keep trying to go into a new jazzy accent, and I'm trying really hard not to. 
Because then I just sound like D'Angelo. I'll send somebody to contact you. I know where you sleep. Nice place. Heard good things about the security there. I wonder if they're true. He gives you the ugliest, nastiest smile you've ever seen. It makes him look like an anthropomorphic piranha. Nice. Get the fuck out before I change my mind and make you into a snack, fledgling. You're pretty sure you're done here. You get out, close the door behind you, and the car immediately starts backing up. The opaque windows slide past you and soon the limo is on its way. As his lackey is nowhere to be seen, so you make your way to your car and drive back, wondering what the Nosferatu broker has in store for you. The hunger calls to you. The city skyscrapers, the seemingly never-ending sprawl of the boroughs, the solar prison. You need to get out, you need to take back control over your life this instant. The memory of your sire's frosty blue eyes mocks you. Tempts you to show your dominance, to prove you have the guts to take what you want. Feeding, that's just the thing. Coaxing, no. Ordering a mortal to bend to your will. Drinking deep from their lifeblood. Faces pass you by. While some look more ravishing than others, any would do right now. You compose yourself, your rational mind fearing a blatant breach of the masquerade's temporary hold over the beast and its compulsions. You compose yourself, your rational mind fearing a blatant breach of the masquerade's temporary hold over the beast and its compulsions. Calming yourself is a small victory in and of itself. The semblance of command will have to do for now, but it won't last. You need to quench this hunger before it overtakes you and makes you lose control. Uh... Oh, I can still visit more people. Let's go see... What do I, where do I want to go? Hmm. I want to go meet these two now, so let's go see uh, Tamika. You make your way through the Grand Army Plaza, passing the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch. You can't help but feel a tinge of nostalgia as you picture the place as you've seen it countless times, in broad daylight, teeming with life. You quickly get over it and pass through the Northwest Gate into Prospect Park. That was a tongue twister. The park is its usual maze of unkempt foliage and dimly lit alleys. Silence hangs in the air, as it would at this time of night, and there doesn't appear to be any sign of kindred presence. You start to suspect Langley's sources fed her a bunch of bullshit, but you're not willing to give up just yet. As you ponder your options, you hear footsteps coming from a behind a line of trees, quick but evenly paced, most likely a late night jogger. No vampire would take kindly to you feeding in their domain, but then again, perhaps you could kill two birds with one stone. Um, I'm gonna feed. You lock onto the sound of footsteps. Predicting the runner's path, you move swiftly, but quietly to intercept them. You hide behind a tree and wait for your prey to get closer. Mere seconds later, a young man in an off-brand tracksuit trots into view. You notice the buds in his ears, beat-heavy music bleeding through. This should make things easier. Just as the man passes by, you emerge behind him and plant your hand firmly on his neck. He struggles at first, desperately trying to break free of your grasp. But as soon as your fangs pierce his skin, panic gives way to peaceful submission. You feel elated as the warm liquid, liquid trickles down your throat. The fresh vitae washes over your senses, sending an orgasmic shiver along your spine. Somewhere in the deepest, darkest crevices of your mind, the beast stirs its slumber. You stop feeding just in time. Your hunger satiated, the beast falls asleep. You sit the day's victim on a nearby bench. As the world comes back into focus, you suddenly realize that something is not right. In a split second, the air by the side of your head swells like a vortex. 
Driven by sheer instinct, you lean back just as five finger-shaped razors cut through the darkness, missing your face by an inch. A clawed shadow jumps back a few paces, preparing to correct its mistake. You catch a glimpse of the assailant. Looks pretty animalistic, alright, but he's not the one you're looking for. For starters, it's a he. Just as he's about to lunge at you, a snarl resounds from the bushes nearby, stopping your foe in their tracks. Out of the shadows emerges a young woman, baring her teeth ever so slightly. She walks over, calmly, her eyes fixed on your assailant. Her presence is enough to make him reconsider attacking you, but not to withdraw completely. He glances over to her, puffing up his chest. Stay out of it, Tam. I smelled her first. Ooh, he looks cool. Um, how about that? She raises an eyebrow, but remains silent. Her compatriot turns back towards you. You shouldn't have come here, girly. I'm gonna fuck you up so bad you'll be wearing your tongue as a fucking necktie. Oh. Tamika looks at you expectantly. Uh, Easy there, I'm not looking for a fight. Easy there, big shot. You've made your point, okay? Confirm badass. I'm not looking for a fight. Tamika tilts her head in a way that's barely noticeable, and yet strangely expressive. She seems... disappointed. Sorry. The man loosens up, his lips twisting into a wry smile. Clearly you just gave him the confidence boost he needed. Figures, you know what you look like? A stuck-up bitch, all high and mighty in a boardroom. But out in the wild, you're just a scared little girl. Well, guess what? You ain't getting off that easy chicken shit. A fierce growl echoes across the alley, stopping the savage in his tracks. Tamika walks over to her comrade, her fangs glistening in the dim lamplight. She puts her hand on the side of his head, caressing his hair and tugging at his ear as if she was scolding a puppy. She leans over and speaks in a voice that's firm yet oddly affectionate. It's okay, Raoul. I'll handle, I'll handle it from here. The male gangrel looks at her with a mix of timidity and resentment. Then he turns back towards you. Fine, they're not worth the effort anyway. Having said his piece, Raoul retreats into the shadows. Although, if you were to guess, he's likely to stay within earshot. With her companion gone, Tabika turns to you once more. What do you want? Uh, I could use your help. Short story, I'm new here and I'm looking for a chance to leave my mark. Maybe shake things up a bit in the process. I could use your help. Why me? My sources claim... Why not? Why not? Why not? An inkling of a smile creeps across her lips. Let's just get one thing straight. If you're looking for a hired gun, I'm not the type. I'm not hiring. I'm not hiring you, I'm offering you my help should you ever need it. And in time, perhaps also my friendship. Do I strike you as somebody who needs a friend? Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do actually. For the first time tonight, she seems caught off guard. You decide to press the advantage. Uh, I know it's not much. Look, I know it's not much, but I sure as hell could use someone to watch my back, so I could watch theirs. So what do you say? For a brief moment, she stands there, motionless, looking straight into your eyes, as if trying not to size- as if- bleh. For a brief moment, she stands there, motionless, looking straight into your eyes, as if trying to size you up. Finally, she looks away. It looks like she's come to a decision. Just so that we're clear, I don't trust you. I have no reason to. Frankly, you sound more lost than I am. Still, there's something about you. You look like you should reek of bullshit, but somehow you don't. So I'll give you a chance to prove yourself. I have some outstanding business to take care of. I'll let you know once that's done. Meet me here and we'll see what you're really made of. So they're not going to come question me feeding on the... in the... in the... What's, what's it called? The Vampire Domain. Is it in this? Oh, uh... Domain. 
They're not gonna come say anything about me feeding in the domain. Okay. And with that, Tamika disappears into the night. That went pretty well, all things considered. <laughs> <laughs>